Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to be um, here with you on this session um, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit all of us uh, from the Quran and to make us among the ones who follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, and to be with him on the Day of Judgment inshaAllah and um, so I, I have to say this is a, a first time I usually do um, an online I'm very more accustomed to the, uh, you know, the class setting, uh, interactive kind of teaching a little bit. So I tend to ask a lot of questions. Um, so I, I, I'm going to, I'm trying to not to do that a little bit, um, so that you like, know, hopefully it will go smoothly. But if I forget and I pose a question, and I might even do it actually, and, and you know, be, please have, uh, you know, be, uh, you know be, feel free to comment um, if you want to answer the questions, just to make it a bit more interactive, if I can, inshallah. Um, so today, the inshallah, we're going to talk about Surah Al-Nahl. Um, and generally speaking, I'm going to do this in terms of a, of a thematic um, tafsir a little bit. So that, inshallah, we can have at least from the part that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to give you, inshallah, the theme of general surah, but how this section that we're going to talk about, inshallah, um, fills in to that uh, main theme. Um, and so uh, that being said, Surah Al-Nahl, I uh, usually tend to speak sometimes about its name. Um, Surah Al-Nahl quite often, it comes from obviously the, the, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned um, in the verses of the Quran, النحل, It's about, taught, spoke about the, um, the, uh, the bees and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, had provided with the instinct to take homes from the mountains and so forth. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the names of the surah um, are quite often um, taught, like, you know, when, it, when it's named, it's named out something that is unique about the surah, something that will kind of like, you know, stick in mind. Um, and perhaps Allah Alam and Nahna is only mentioned this is, is surah, and so it's mentioned by that. But also the, there's another name um, that is quite often sometimes used for the surah. So Nahl is the common name we know it by, it. the Prophet Sallam called it, but they also sometimes called it the surah al-ni'am. Um, and na'am, which means the bounties or the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we see, especially from the first section, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this uh, surah a lot of bounties and a lot of favors, uh, a lot of like, you know, blessings which he has uh, favored upon the servants and the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has blessed us with. Um, and this is to prove a specific uh, objective, inshallah. Um, and it has to do with the theme of the surah in a sense. So... The other thing generally is good to know about the surah is whether it's Meccan or Madani, because that would help you figure out the theme or understand the, the, you know, the direction the surah is going in. Um, and this surah is Meccan, um, and so all the verses are Meccan. Um, however, there's a debate um, about three of the verses, whether they're Madani or not. Um, and so they said there are three of the verses that are Madani that have been revealed after the Battle of Uhud. Um, and those are not going to be the ones we're interpreting today, inshallah. So these are, are towards the end. So it's 162 until 128. Um, some opinions, it's a bit of like, you know, maybe five verses. Uh, sometimes they put 95, 96, 97 with it. However, just the general whole of the surah is mainly a Meccan surah. With the exception, maybe like, you know, anywhere between three to five verses, uh, depending on some of the opinions of the scholars. Um, now, in terms of the objective of, of, the, of the surah, um, the main general theme um, it has to do very close to be like closely related to the Meccan surahs because in the Meccan period, the Prophet وسلم, um, in that time was focused on um, dispelling the wrong ideologies of of of, um, of the disbelievers at the head of that time. And so many of the verses of, of the Meccan surah have the attribute of affirming the um, establishing the the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa taala, along with the proofs that come along with this. Um, tawheed that like you know, proves logically and, and even like you know, some of the signs around us of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like you know, that he is the creator and so that he is the one to be worshipped but it also emphasizes the um, the other forms of fundamentals of belief whether it's believing in the hereafter um, or believing in the uh, days of resurrection um, and some of the things of the unseen such as the angels and so forth um, so this is the main theme of, of the surah right? so it has to do with, with establishing the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in the wahi itself, revelation, establishing the, you know, the reality of revelation, the truth of revelation, that the Prophet is receiving a revelation, and that there's a day of resurrection. Um, and and uh, like, you know, the, the, the first few verses, inshallah, that we're going to talk about um, really does play into that. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Away. 
Um, and the way I did this, I kind of divided the, the verses we're going to explain into three different sections that helped kind of tailor to that uh, main theme. Um, and the first one is, is just like, you know, just the first two verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right away from the beginning, um, establishes his oneness. Uh, when he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, ata amrullah fa lata sta'ajiluh, subhanahu wa ta'ala amma tushrikun, yunazzulu malaika ta biruhi min amrihi ala min yusha'u min ibadihi an anziru annahu la ilaha illa ana fattaqun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from off the battle over here, he's, he's saying like, you know, that the, the command or the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come or it's coming. Actually, I should say like, you know, I should use the present tense that it used. Ata uh, amrullah, which means it has come, right? Um, not that it's coming in the future, because really this is very important. I'm going to mention this why in a second. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it in the past tense, not in the present or the future tense, but in the past tense, atta, which means it has come over here, right? Um, so at the, the, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come. So do not um, do not be impatient, do not be hasty. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yishrikun, um, exalted he and high above uh, what they associate from him. Um, then he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, yunazzulu malaikata wa biruhi, then he... Um, like you know, he he sends down the angels with revelation, with inspiration, min uh, amrihi from his command, right? By his command, upon whomever he wills, um, to so that they would give warning and uh, so that they would warn that there's no deity except me, um, so fear me or have taqwa of me. Now, just to put this in perspective, the reason this verse was perhaps revealed was because many of the times that these believers of Quraysh, they would uh, almost challenged the Prophet وسلم, and they would like you know they would tell him like you know well if you promise like you know destruction if you promise like you know the hereafter well let it come whatever if there's a true punishment let it come when is the hereafter like you know when is the hour gonna come um, and so they're almost kind of being challenging um, and so they were almost like you know asking for their destruction they're hastening and they're very impatient for their own destruction and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and he says it has come right do not be hasty Right. And so this is establishing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in command. It is for him the order. And, and we have to think about this also as, like, you know, yes, this is talking to disbelievers, but also as, as Muslims, we also have to be sensitive to think about it, that yes, it's true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in command. His order is established. Now, there's, uh, I have mentioned earlier that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought this in the past tense, because in the Arabic language, anything that is for sure going to happen, even if it's the future, when it's used in the past tense, is very powerful emphasis that it will happen. And of course, when we talk to this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says something's going to happen in the future, then it's almost as if it has already happened. And this is one of the beautiful like, you know, ways that the Quran is, is in the linguistics of the Quran. Um, and so he's telling us, like, you know, he's telling them, don't, don't be hasty um, with your punishment uh, that's going to happen. Um, and then the same verses are, are, are glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are saying that he's exalted above anything, and there's nothing like him, there's no partners. Um, and so because he is the one that is the Lord, he is the one that also um, like, you know, allows the angels or orders them to descend down with the revelation on the prophets. So over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talked about several levels. The first level is himself, right? He, he began the, the verse of the Quran with the, he said, Atta amrullah, right? And then he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he went to the next one, which is the angels, right? And then what do the angels do? They bring down their revelations to the prophets and it's the job of the prophets to warn the people of what's going to happen if it's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, but also give them glad tidings um, if they, um, and like you know, if they obey Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, and so th this is like you know, this is just the introduction of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala telling us like you know that um, this is the one of Subhanahu wa Taala. He is all in command, and there are the angels and revelations, the job of the prophets. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the next verses, and I'm going to take this from verse number three. I'm going to say it's from verse number three all the way until um, maybe perhaps. Uh, verse number 18 okay um, so from verse number three to number 18 this entire section is dedicated to prove the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and provide the evidence for it and in the Arabic language they, they say this like you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this by showing like you know like you know the, the evidences of uh, al-khalq that he like you know, of the creation itself but also not just in that, but also the leader the ayah. So the leader which is the evidence that, like you know, it's not just the creation that created, but there's also a level of perfection to that creation. And then the third level is that there is a level of, like you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala create caring for the creation, providing for them. And so all these levels indicates that there is a a something behind that, um, a, a creator that has created all these things that also has the uh, like you know knowledge and the ability and the power and the wisdom. Uh, 
um, and there's care being given. And if there's care being given, then there must be something behind it providing it because this can never be happening in chance. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned all these evidences. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala started with like, you know, mentioning things such as the um, the heavens, right? So خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ That he has created um, the heavens and the earth um, in truth, right? not in falsehood. So he said he's above what they associate with him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, like, you know, some of the greatest, started with the greatest of creation, you can never deny. Look at the heavens and look at this entire earth, which is a more difficult and a larger creation than the human beings. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions the human being due to their noble status and how he has created them in different stages, right? So starting from the uh, the mutfa, which is the, like, you know, uh, from the, like, you know, a drop of, of sperm and, and an egg together. Um, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nurtures it and develops it until to the point that this individual, this human being, has the intellectual capacity to argue and debate. Um, so it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, like, you know, he created them and he cared for them and created for the humans being provided for them, uh, nur nurtured them, uh, disciplined them, and they have the intelligence and how all these things until they become individuals who argue. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, um, like, you know, the, the, the other forms of blessings upon us. Um, and, and you'll notice as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning all these things, He's saying that he has created for man, right? And so this is the ri'ayah aspect. The aspect that Allah SWT has created these things for you. And there's a purpose for it because Allah SWT created the heavens and the earth in truth. So what is the purpose of this? It's just a reminder that you have a creator. There's a purpose for why you created. And it's and I have to say also that these beautiful like, you know, verses as they come along, they really do establish a person, like, you know, a yaqeen, uh, like, you know, the, the, the certainty of a person's belief. Because if you really ponder upon these evidence that Allah SWT mentions, there is no way out of this except to believe um, that uh, he, he's the creator. Um, and those who deny it, right? SubhanAllah, Allah SWT mentions at the end of verse 22, we're going to mention this, is because one of the main reasons of it, perhaps it is arrogance. And we're going to touch on that a little bit. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions like you know the anam and which are the grazing stock, right? That he has created and there's benefit in these for us. We use them for warmth. And for other things, we eat from them, there's milk from them, we rind at some of them. Um, and then there's like, you know, the mules, the, the camels, the, um, the, the, uh, the horses, uh, we ride on them. And there's also adornment and decorations for us because it's on nature, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in us the love um, and boasting perhaps of our rides. Yesterday, it's in the form of cars, uh, but it's still in, this, in our instinct. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, he also creates what you do not know. Um, and this is a very you know, powerful, profound statement because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when and he's mentioning these things, he's relating to individuals who lived at a time where the only things that they see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is relating to them, like, you know, uh, uh, asks them to think about the things that they as around them, to contemplate, to ponder about it, and the things around them that they usually ride or the creation around them, the things that they see, such as the horses, the mules. But then he also, he said, and he creates what you don't know. To show us that there are other things that the still these people haven't discovered, and maybe later on it'll be discovered. Other creations, other beings that perhaps you might use as mounts. And we know this today, whether it's the creations of, of like you know, the creation of the of the planes or the cars. And so it's left that statement to tell us that there are things that we do not know that we might discover later on, but even things that are you know, there are creatures that we still until the same might not know we might discover later on. And so Allah SWT tells us that He has his creation is many, and there are things that we did not uh, that we do not know. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he um, uh, mentioned these things, like, you know, he also had mentioned, and he said, in, like, you know, in verse number side, it's that uh, to Allah, if you want to reach to Allah, you have to um, seek that sirat, right, that path. And then also be careful of the things that would lead you astray. Because really, there's only one path that would lead you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the sirat al-mustaqeem, that's through Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent a revelation to the Prophet sallam, and the prophets to tell us what this way is. And all the other ways do not lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather they lead you astray. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in this, like in, in all these things that has been mentioned so far, is evidences for people who have intellect, the people who think. Um, and so this really pushes us that, you know, that, uh, that this religion, uh, it, there's no such thing as, as blind faith, but rather it, it is like, you know, deeply rooted in evidences. We just have to think about these evidences, ponder upon them. Um, and that would help really reinforce our certainty, our yaqeen, and increase it. Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created things in a specific way, in laws, um, and this is called the sunan, so that it is beneficial for us. But also, who created these sunans? Muslims, someone has created them. There's a specific way, a specific things, a mechanism things have to work by. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further goes on, even like in you know, verses 12 and so forth, and he, he shows us the different layers of his bounties upon us. Right? And subhanAllah, you have to think like, you know, all these bounties upon us, shouldn't we not thank the one who has created it? Can it come out of all the chance? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, he says, look, all these things, they do not come by chance. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he has created for you the day and the night, or the night and the day, and the, and the sun, and the, uh, and the moon, and even the stars. And they all, they travel by his order. In these verses, like, you know, these signs, there are signs for people who have, like, you know, brains, they think. Which means that sometimes, maybe perhaps some of people's unguidance, they're not guided because they don't use their intellect. They don't think, they can ponder. And so they almost, like, you know, uh, the, the 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 beautiful bounty of the uh, intellect, the brains that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us, it's not being put to good use, but rather to other purposes, to other uh, like, you know, things that they're being uh, that, you know that they use it for. Um, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala like you know points another something else, and what He has put in the earth for us, the different colors and shades that like, you know that come in it, um, that He has even like you know. Um, Subhanahu wa ta'ala subjected to the, the oceans and the seas so that we would eat from its meat. These are different sources for us. And then we also bring out from them the um, decorations and adornments that we might wear. And then you see the oceans that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us the intellect, to, sorry, the boats and the large ships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the intellect um, to create that we ride on them. This is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and so... Uh, like, you know, these are bounties that we need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, he says, like, you know, Al -qafir and, um, and that he has, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he, he, um, he created the, the, the earth and the mountains, right? To firm, to make me firm and establish them so that the, the ground would not, um, like, you know, move from us. Um, so he has, like, you know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has, like, made it firm and set it by mountains so that it would not shift from us. And uh, now we know these things are called the tectonic plates. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's from his mercy, and these are considered some of the miracles of the Quran and scientific uh, proofs, um, is that the mountains do really hold down the earth from, from shifting from underneath of us. Um, and so he said over here, and then rivers and roads so that you can um, like, you know, seek that you may be guided. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues um, once again to like, you know, mention like, you know, one favor after another. And he says, um, in, like, you know, I'm jumping to verse 17 over here, and it, when it says, like, you know, when you're looking at all these creations, he says a very interesting question. He poses a question. He says, He says, like, you know, there's the one who creates, is the one who, like, you know, and then he is he the one who creates. Like the one who does not create, um, so will you not be reminded? So this is compelling us to understand something or to look at something, and this is really addressing the the people of Quraysh who put deities and 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 gods with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He's asking them, look at everything around you, right? It has to have a reason, like it has to have come some, come from somewhere, um, and this is called the sabab, which means the like you know contingency, the argument of contingency that everything is dependent on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This creation would not come. Except from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and it has to be only one creator, right? Um, because he has to be like you know the, the, the original source of all these things. And so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Look at the ones who are worshiping. Did they create something? Is the one who has created uh, more rightful to be worshipped, or the ones that who have not created?" Right? Um, and so he's telling us to think. But also, like you know, uh, this this reminds me of another verse in the Quran that has to do with like you know how some of these like you know, intellectual arguments, the logic that's being used, um, that also have to do with creation. How Allah Subhanahu wa Taala proved that He is the Creator by asking like you know questions to human beings, and He told them, uh, um, "Were they created from nothing, or did they create themselves?" Because when you think about like you know us as being created, there's only three options, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala over here mentioned two because the third one is the obvious one. So he said, he said, were they created from nothing? And we know that there's like you know, there's no such thing as nothing, like you know, as something coming from nothing. It does not work. Um, it's logically impossible. Um, physically impossible, you want to think about it, whatever the case is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging me. He said, Did they, were they created from like you know nothing? Um or did they create themselves? 
which also is not possible. And so you're only left with the third thing is that there is something that has created them. And that thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that being the most powerful being, the knowledgeable, the wise is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that verse, he also points out something else. After mentioning all these bounties, right, all these favors, he says something else. He says, see how we're counting up these things. But still, even if you try to count the blessings of Allah upon you, you would not count them. Inna Allah um, Rahim. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, al Rahim, which means that he is um, uh, like, you know, the most forgiving. He's the forgiving, the merciful. Ghafur, the forgiving, Rahim, the merciful. We have to ask ourselves, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention like, you know, these two qualities, these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ghafur Rahim, with we are unable to count the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps Allah alam is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that his bounties upon us are so immense. And that maybe perhaps no matter what we do, we won't be able to count it. And so we are unable to truly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet it's because of his mercy that he will accept from us, like, you know, um, just thanking him for those bounties. And so should we not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these bounties? Um, and part of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to admit his oneness, to worship only him. To direct our life and our hearts only towards Him, because in the end, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has created our hearts to worship Him. These are called the actions of the heart, which is the most important aspect, um, uh, like you know, for us is the heart, because the road to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is really, truly, truly crossed by the actions of the heart. And what really differentiates one action from the other, even two people might be doing the same action, is truly what's in their heart. Two individuals can be standing in prayer side to side, side by side. And yet one of them, the bounties that he is getting and the reward is so much immense only by because of what they are is in their heart from the complete love and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, uh, going to connect it to the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking about these bounties, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this for us and that he cares for us. And so naturally speaking, he will guide us. He will send messengers for us. And there's a purpose for all this. And it's to worship him only. Shouldn't we not thank him for all these bounties and worship him truly as we should? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here, and this is the end of the second part, or, or like in the second section. The third one over here, which is just the last few verses from 19 to 21, is really establishing the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and improving that it is him. And all other things that are being worshipped are false. When he says, Wallahu ma wa ma That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you conceal and what you are, um, like, you know, you say and declare. So this is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So he knows everything, all aspects of details. Now, do all, like, you know, the other things that are being worshipped, do they have that level of, of knowledge? Do they have that level of ability? And those who you worship, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you invoke, you call to them, they create nothing and they themselves are created, which means that they themselves are in need of the creator. So how could they be worshipped? Right? If they are in need to be created, how can they themselves create anything? They are dead and they're not alive because a lot of times they're either statues or trees or even the moon or the earth, they are dead. And they do not even know when you will be resurrected, even when they become resurrected until the end. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the last verse that we're talking about over here, last verse number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an insight of the evidence of why some people disbelieve. He says, ilahu ilahu wahid. He affirms subhanahu wa ta'ala that indeed your God is one, your Lord, ilah. And by the way, ilah over here is, is a beautiful combination between, it means the one who is worshipped, but also the one who is loved, right? is truly one. The ones who do not believe, right? In the hereafter, the issue is with the heart. Their heart is denying and they are um, which means that they are arrogant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mentioned two things over here. One problem that they have is their hearts, which means that we as Muslims should be careful. We need to watch our own hearts. Right? And the other problem is that their arrogance. That is a source that causes a person to disbelieve. And so we ourselves should be careful like, you know, of this arrogance. This is why arrogance is one of the major sins. It's something that is uh, detrimental, something that can eat up away at your conviction, uh, your conviction, eat away at your iman. And so we have to be careful with that. 
And just to prove to the point that, that subhanAllah, it was the arrogance that drove many of the people in Quraysh from, from believing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, like, you know, the simplest example is Abu Jah, right? The people of Quraysh like, you know, never doubted the honesty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And so the question is, why, why wouldn't they believe? Um, and, and, a, and a beautiful story like, you know, that mentions this, of, of how, what their situation was, um, is, is Abu Jah himself, when his, his, um, his, his, ne- his nephew asked him, and his name is Nuswar, of, uh, Nuswar ibn Mukhrama, he asked him, he said, like, you know, my uncle, like, you know, would, did you ever accuse Muhammad in, like, in lying? Did you ever like, you know, accuse him of being a liar? Before he said what he said, which means before he said that I'm a messenger. And so he said, the Ibn Ukhti, which means my, like, you know, my nephew, Wallahi, that Muhammad, like, and I'm going to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we need to should, was among us a young um, individual, right, a youth, and he was called by the trustworthy, he was called the Amin. We never ever experienced any life from him. He never lived lies. So, so the nephew asked, like, you know, my uncle, then wh- why, like, you know, why don't you follow him? And so Abu Jahl over here now, this is this is where we, like, you know, the arrogance part comes in. He says, like, you know, my nephew, listen, like, you know, we and Banu Hashim, right? Banu Hashim is, is the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu And he said, تنزعنا, which means we competed in nobility, right? And so when they fed, we fed. When they gave water, the wasaqo, which means like, you know, when the, the hajj season comes, they used to provide water. They used to sweeten the water and give it to the hujjaj. We also did it, right? Wajaru ajarna, which means that they sheltered people. They gave them protection. So we gave them protection, also protection. Hatta idha tajatayna ala rukab, ala rukab yikunna farasayrihan. And so we all both, like, you know, we were almost like knee to knee. We were like horses that are shoulder to shoulder in a race. We are equals. What did they say? They said... Minna Nabi from us as a prophet, how would we ever do that? So this tells you that the reason behind it is because it's more of, of, of an arrogance. How can they be better than us? Um, uh, like you know, there, there's like you know, even another hadith. Abu Jahan says like you know, um, and this is after like you know, uh, on the day of Badr, like Abu Jahan, like Abu Jahan was being asked, like you know, he said, tell me like you know about uh, one was asking this, like tell me about Muhammad. Is he a liar? Or is he truthful? Right? Um, and he says, listen, there's nobody around us. Tell me the truth. Um, and so Abu Jahl said, like, you know, woe to you. Wallahi, Muhammad, like, you know, Muhammad is, is, is truthful. And he never lied. But uh, Banu Qusay, which is also the tribe of Prophet he said they went with the Luwa, which is the, the, you know, the flag of war, or Siqaya, which is, like, you know, the watering for the, like, you know, the, 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 the people. And then a Nabuwa, which is profited. And so he said, what is left for the people of Quraysh? So this tells you, shows you clearly how, subhanAllah, sometimes arrogance um, can really be detrimental to one's faith and religion. Um, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made it um, one of the major sins and the Prophet had said and he mentioned they will not enter a person who has a speck of, of, of dust, of arrogance in his heart. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the ones who um, ponder upon the penalties and name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to comprehend them and, and absorb them so that we would truly be able to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for his bounties upon us. Uh, we were all, we're always going to be in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is not in need of us uh, for he is the Samad. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove any, any traces of, of arrogance um, or anything that would uh, lower our iman and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the ones who benefit from the Quran and to make us among the ones who would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the judgment. Um, and I think I only have a minute left, so um, I'm going to stop here. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, I think... Uh, it will be moderated, uh, so go ahead and fire away if you uh, have any questions, inshallah. And um, hopefully, inshallah, it's within topic. I'll try to answer as best as I can. Uh, um, so one of the questions that we got is um, the signs that are mentioned in the surah, are they interconnected with each other? The signs are they interconnected again? So some of them, uh, some of them are connected, um, but generally, the general theme of connection with them is really shows two things mainly: um, is the beautiful ability of the creator. So it talks about the ability of the creator himself, um, because all these all these creations are miraculous in them, the immense like, kind of details, the beauty in them. But also the other unifying thing between them is that they were created for the human beings for their benefit. Um, and subhanAllah, without all these things, we would not, as human beings, uh, be able to live and fulfill our role in this life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is mentioning all these things. And the one thing perhaps unifying the connection between all of them is that they were created for our benefits as human beings. 
so that we would be able to fulfill our role and obligations that Allah Taala has bestowed upon us. Um, which also means we should not be using them um, in other things uh, that would displease Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Whether it's like you know how we run our days, our sites, or even like you know the boats or, or whatever the case is that we use the rise, the mounts, um, or anything that we think about uh, from the bounties Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given us. Exactly. Yet there are still people out there, and many of them who do not believe. And um, so, how would you approach that and those uh, when you're discussing with them? How would you approach them? Right. Well, I, to be honest, this is, a very, this is an excellent question. Um, I'm assuming that the question has to do with uh, mainly atheists, uh, because like, you know, when you talk about the Jews and the Christians, uh, we don't have any problem convincing that there is a creator. However, the problem happens uh, when we're talking about atheists. Um, now, the, for to be able to address them, you have to understand what's the, the fundamental issue or the principal um, issue behind why they're having these 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 things and why even like you know, the signs around Allah Subhanahu wa Taala um, are not any signs with them. It's because the entire system they built around them um, has made them numb to this. And I'm gonna I'm gonna step back to explain what I mean. The problem with the modern atheists is that they um, philosophically speaking, they have a problem of the types of sources that are being used or what is considered a credible source to attain knowledge. Okay. And I know this is getting a bit into details, but really if you, if you want to talk to an atheist, this is, you have to clear this out, right? So you have to talk about what are, the, what are the, the lines of evidences that can be used to prove that there is a creator or no creator. Now the atheist will tell you, the atheist will tell you, I only believe in the scientific method, right? Things that I can sense. Um, but as Muslims, right, or even like, you know, even if you talk about like, you know, uh, epistemology, uh, which is the field of studying knowledge, uh, there are three main sources usually, and, and depending on the philosophy you read at, but as Muslims, we believe that there are three main sources which we attain our knowledge. Uh, one is, yes, it's true, our senses, right, experimental, we see around us, but that is also limited to, to a certain extent. But the other source is usually transmission, things that you hear, right? Uh, for example, when you hear news of something, and we use that in our daily life, uh, people who were born like um, before birth certificates, they were told they're born in a certain place or their family uses this, we believe in them. This is transmission, right? And then the third one is logic. And when we're talking about logic is, is, is over here, we're, we're talking about uh, definitive logic, things that we all agree with. There's nobody dif different differentiates or disagrees with, right? Uh, for example, that one plus one equals two or that opposites cannot be um, in the same entities. I cannot say, for example, an object is moving and stationary, right? Um, so when you talk about these signs, really you're talking about logic, right? You're talking about the evidence and proofs of, of the creation, right? So this is definitive logic that there is a creation, it must have a creator, okay? Um, and, and that creator is Allah Taala. and you look at these signs, but the atheist is not really looking at that. To him, he says only true knowledge uh, is, is really just the you know, scientific things. I want to see things, I want to experiment things. But then for you to be able to debate them, you have to debate this aspect first. And it's very easy to contradict them because then you have to tell them then, okay, you made a system of belief then prove to me that the scientific method or only the senses are the only way to prove what is true or false, or that's the only source of knowledge. They're gonna have to resort to one of the other two methods, right? And so this is when you first start with the contradictions. Once they agree to this, then you start moving around with all the other different evidences, bringing along into them the science around us of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Um, but, I, but I also have to say that it's kind of interesting is, is that the, um, because the, like, you know, the, the, the atheists, they try to use the a Darwinian evolution aspect of things as a mechanism to everything, to, as proofs to everything. Like, you know, look at the signs where well, it got evolved, right? Uh, but if you even want to argue with them, so it makes them kind of numb to this place. So you need to kind of change their paradigm of thinking a little bit, right? Shift their, their view of how things work um, and make them doubt that in the first place. Um, and so you're going to have to, it's going to take a little bit of time, but you're going to have to move back to the original source of the problem because otherwise it's not going to work. No matter how many debates you work, you, you talk about, uh, but in the end, one thing you can tell them uh, or at least if you're not going to do that, is get to the point that science, right, their, their methodology or science in reality only has to do with the physical realm. To jump beyond that, to try to prove that there is a Allah or not is beyond the realm of science. Now they are jumping more into using philosophy and logic, right? Um, and so in, in, in reality, the, the, the science cannot prove or disprove definitively the existence or absence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I know I branched a little bit, but just kind of wanted to give more of a a comprehensive um, idea how to deal with it. It's a bit more complicated than one would expect. Mulan. Um, the next question that we have is, um, 
what is the difference between just simply being proud and being arrogant? What is the difference between being proud and being arrogant? Being proud and being arrogant. So the best way to describe arrogance, right, is as how the Prophet ﷺ had described it. Um, which means that you look down upon people, right? And you, which means you deny the truth, right? Or prevent the truth, or you deny the truth when you see it. So to any, any, like, you know, those things are, is, is considered arrogance. Pride is to, like, you know, generally speaking, to be proud of something that, you, that has been accomplished. Um, so those are two different things, because a person can be a proud of his accomplishment, but not look down upon others, right? Uh, but also, we have to be careful that pride is also not attributed to our own, uh, but it also has to be always attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's the one that enabled us to do this. He's given us the faculties and the, like, you know, the means and the uh, ability to do all these things. So we have to like, you know, be sure that it's also associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, arrogance is a bit different, right? It goes beyond that. Um, uh, a person can be arrogant with